I'm going to take everybody to the mountaintop, <laughs> the temple on the hill that runs our lives, uh, called the Federal Reserve. One of the wonderful things that happened in our three years of crisis and meltdown, not widely appreciated in Washington, was that the Federal Reserve lost its cover, big time. Mm -hmm. And uh, it has had, since its creation, a mystique uh, encouraged by economists who wish for the good favor of the Federal Reserve themselves, and bankers and politicians and everybody else, that literally, literally educated Americans into ignorance. They took this, one of the central issues of any economy, and especially a democratic societies, which is money and banking, off the table and said, we're going to consign this to the temple, and they are all wizards and disinterested experts, etc., etc. Do you know the story? Shock and education occurred rather rapidly, starting in 07. Um, my favorite moment was Nancy Pelosi, who who, believe me, knows this stuff. She read my book years ago and still plugs it. When the Fed went to bail out AIG and popped $80 billion on the table, she had a press briefing the next day and she said, some of us are wondering, where did the Fed get $80 billion? And it's interesting that they could give this money to an insurance company, it's not a bank after all, without coming to Congress and asking anybody for permission. <laughs> and she was teasing the Fed a bit because she knew she knew the answers, but that was sweeping across the country and I think was extremely healthy. The Fed is now mired in politics where a lot of the mythology, namely that it's independent, have just blown up. They, nobody will believe that again for good reason. They put $3.3 trillion in circulation to help not just AIG and the leading banks, but large and small firms across the country. And I suggest a, a, if you want to organize people, you could say, were you on that list? <laughs> and that goes to a lot of the good stuff that's been said here. This is a political situation that is not confined to the usual uh, limits of progressive, liberal, lefty, whatever we call ourselves because it goes to all of those institutions in the economy that uh, that are that either didn't know and now know or have been sulking for years about the advantages that the government hands out to certain institutions and not to others and uh, and they're now on the table invisible this politics is going to get stronger I predict because the Fed is Governors are now earnestly trying to write the rules for the financial reform legislation. And one of those rules is how do we define, quote, systemically important, which is their way of saying too big to fail. Now, they, of course, want to prevent having to do that again, but most people in finance and banking understand that if you're on that list, you are now a member visibly of a privileged club that the government will not let you go down. It's just that simple. And market players, out of their own reasonable curiosity, will quickly surface that list. I don't expect the Fed to give us 35 names, but it, once, you, once they've written the rules, it, people who can run the numbers will figure out who they're talking about. And maybe they'll put the names out. It doesn't matter. That's a new reality uh, in American capitalism. You could argue with some merit that 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 reality has actually existed informally for many years. Now it's going to be formalized. Uh, when they passed the bill, and, and Heather was in that fight, and, and it, it was a really, in the Senate particularly, it was a really interesting, and I say a hopeful fight, because um, the, the, the Democratic majority blocked the most important measures in amendments come on, but they, but they had roll calls on a number of them, and a majority of the Democrats voted yes. And then, then they got overwhelmed by Republicans and other Democrats. Sherrod Brown, who sponsored one of them, which was, let's get rid of too big to fail, let's make smaller banks. Let's you know, put a limit on size and so forth and begin shrinking these 10, 8, 10 behemoths. He lost that vote, but he was feeling very good afterwards. He said, this is coming back, and it won't take another crisis to bring it back. And the reason it's coming back 
is because once uh, the, these new rules proceed, corporations, both business and financial, will see that they're on the wrong side of this line and that they are going to be competing against somewhat bigger organizations, institutions, that have this protection. And, and he, he predicted that, like some other issues, the, the business front is going to split into different parts. That's another political opportunity, but I think it's, it's, it depends a lot, of course, on, on, uh, on what, uh, what the public uh, sees and understands. And so that's a big role for agitators like us. To go back to Nancy Pelosi's remark, that's to me the other element, the, the quandary of, of really sophisticated people in this town when I would try gently to explain to them that the Fed has always created money out of thin air. There's nothing new in that. What, she, what they have in their heads now is, is, is fertile ground to go come back to, uh, Ellen calls it the social credit, which was a famous theme in the 20s, and, and uh, there were establishment economists in the 1930s who said the Federal Reserve should do what we're now going to propose and that is to mimic Abraham Lincoln and his famous greenbacks. And, and, and that's ours, for a moment at least, until it puts that money in the banks. And then it's the banks. And the banks, as we know, spin it off into more money creation and so forth and so on. I'm not suggesting that the banks ought to be cut out of that process. I don't think they should. But that, that space that belongs to us, the American people, can skip over the banks and feed it directly into the real economy. And Ellen gave a version of how that could happen. Another version, which I just sort of made up, but it's actually an old, old idea, again going back to the 30s. Um, you create an, a, an intermediary, which is a public institution, a federal reconstruction and recovery bank, let's call it, and Congress defines very concrete uh, functions that it can fulfill. It has to be limited, it has to be carefully done, has to be has to be visible and reasonable to all normal people. The Fed, instead of depositing that money in a thousand banks or five hundred banks or two hundred banks, sends it to this bank that the people own, and the bank gives them something back in paper. Of, 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 basically, it's interest-free money. Uh, and it has a list of projects that Congress has already authorized and may be partially financed, and it spends that money, free money, you may say, on those projects. If We've all been over this ground. If you look at the infrastructure backlog in this country, never mind doing what we ought to be doing for the future, like building high-speed rail and other things, uh, transforming uh, energy systems, we will never catch up on the regular system of borrowing and taxing to build those things. It's, it's over. I mean, we'll do some stuff, but we'll never catch up with that backlog. This is a way to get out of that dilemma. I would add, if you go this way, you then have another reform, which people, good people, have been arguing for for 30 or 40 years, and Congress, for obvious and self-interested reasons, doesn't want to do it. The federal budget is... A, is a, is a con lunatic concoction of itself. In that, it makes no distinction between paying the bills to operate this year and the capital, public capital, you investing in long-term development. You build a road, or you build a bomber plane for that matter, all of those systems are the same as handing out food stamps or handing out unemployment checks or whatever. If you split the budget, as any corporation will mm -hmm. do, between capital spending and regular operating revenues, you now have a much more rational basis for making decisions about what you ought to invest in. And you really give the politicians a, a, a lever to avoid the, the short-term excesses and go for the long-term development of the society. Um, I could go on in that vein, but I think I want to talk a few more minutes about the politics of the Federal Reserve. Because I've been obsessed with this institution for 20 years or more, I feel these things deeply. I hope you're getting that sense. But, but really, um, 
it is important to understand that when, when Woodrow Wilson, um, the progressive, the, the so-called, went for that compromise back in 1913, he didn't have any clue what he was doing, of course, but he was permanently stunning American democracy. And we, and, and when you say, you look at the American public today, they're clueless about the Fed and the, and the economist's strict chuckle. That was done on purpose. It was not an accident. Bankers understood what they were doing. They were creating this little hybrid preserve, secretive by its nature, and it's still pretty much that way. Now, Brother Bernanke and his, and his friends have been hammered pretty hard in the last couple of years, so they decided, after Congress ordered them, to put some names and facts on the table, and they'll be under more pressure. But I think there's a deeper reform, which is to literally shut down the temple as it currently exists and, and create a government agency that, is, that manages the money supply and has uh, a, a list of public obligations, which I've got to add, this is also important to understand, the Federal Reserve departed big time from its public obligations back in 1980 under Paul Volcker when it turned hard right. People, including smart people in Washington, still don't quite understand this. Labor people understand it because it happened to them. Volcker targeted organized labor and targeted labor wages, and he did it relentlessly year after year, and he was a part, I don't say he did it single-handedly, but he was a part of decimating industrial mm -hmm. unions. They never, the Fed never got credit for that, except in my book and a few other places. <laughs> but that's that's important to understand. That's a that's why it has to be democratized. It's yes, they will screw up. Yes, they will, they will love bankers. We're not going to break them the habit of that. But making it public starts over again with a with a monetary policy and obligations of monetary policy that are very different from what the Fed has been doing for 30 years, and actually what it, it did do, <coughs> clumsily maybe, in, in the decades before. Um, the problem with this change, at first if not to mention the fear people will have, especially in financial circles, that this is the road to Argentina or something like you know, that, so you, you know all those cliches. But um, the real problem is that is the government, is the, is, are our elected representatives capable of handling this? And that's a fair question, mm -hmm. uh, to put it mildly. But, mm -hmm. but, but I, so I could make a, in fact I wrote this at some point in the last year or two in the nation. You can do it in stages. I, where I would begin is self-education. Uh, if Nancy Pelosi were speaker, I had a shot at convincing her of this. I think that's out the window, but it's still a good idea. Like the Budget Committee, or like the Intelligence Committee for that matter, I don't want secrecy, but I want an institution within the Congress that is a more or less neutral source of, of real information, and it has to encompass many different perspectives, unlike the Budget Committee, which I think has gone to the right and is now kind of accountants. Uh, idea of what government should do. We want, a, we want a, 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 a special committee or parallel institution of monetary policy which is committed to educating its own members first, not to mention the public, and which occasionally will propose resolutions instructing the central bank agency, wherever you house it, call it independent if you like, on what they what they don't like about monetary policy. You're going too far this way, you're going that far, you're ignoring this. Imagine if that kind of institutional structure had existed over the last 10 years. It would have been a place where bitter, hard arguments were made, again, in public, about the condition of the economy. Ask yourself, did the Federal Reserve uh, ever wring its hands in public about what, what was coming? Did it see what was coming? We all know people in this town, some of our friends, were on soapboxes waving the bloody shirt long before the crash. And the government could ignore them. And politicians would have a harder time ignoring those voices if they were responsible again. 
makes it easy because the Constitution, we're all originalists here, <laughs> said, gives the power to regulate and, uh, money, to create it and regulate its value to the Congress, not to the President, not to the Treasury, not to the Federal Reserve, didn't exist. So we've got a good old-fashioned conservative basis for arguing for this. Um, I would add some a few features that, uh, like a kind of rotating expertise. Uh, I like I, 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 forget, I wrote this somewhere some someday. A council of elders. <laughs> I think this could work all over government, frankly. But you, but you take sort of retired governors or senators even, but uh, preferably outside Washington, even uh, business executives who know what they're doing. And they're, they are they're kind of your watchdog. They meet regularly, they, they have the power to ask questions and get answers from government officials, and above all, they are, they are obligated to report their concerns. That's the kind of reform that if, that, if, if it existed for the Fed, we might have been saved some pain, maybe not, but, uh, but I, I, I guess my deepest hope is that this can be a pass toward uh, rehabilitating uh, representative democracy. And because it asks the members of Congress, especially in the House of Representatives, uh, to take themselves seriously and to be responsible. And we all know that most of the games that now go on in Washington, the members know if you stick your head up and take yourself seriously and stand up on stuff, you are simply putting yourself at risk. And, and so we need to change a lot of things. That's great.